Norman Doidge, welcome to Booktopia. Thank you for having me. It's great to have you here. I feel that with the brain that changes itself, you gave the world so much hope and you sent us all off in a way to learn to play the violin <laughs> or learn ballroom dancing or Sudoku to kind of get our brains to embrace neuroplasticity and what it could offer. What's the latest good news in your new book? Well, in the, in the first book, I was trying to establish that the brain is plastic and that it's relevant, clinically relevant and culturally relevant. And some of the ways that I established that were uh, very unusual, talking about unusual situations. A woman born with half a brain missing her left hemisphere, which is usually thought to be to house the processors for speech, and yet she can speak um, almost normally, mm. and so on. And in this book, I'm talking about some very common problems, uh, major neurological problems like Parkinson's, uh, MS, tra a lot about traumatic brain injury, as well as childhood psychiatric disorders, autism, ADD, sensory processing problems, um, Asperger's and things like that, and chronic pain, and showing how relevant plasticity is. But the twist is, after the brain that changes itself, um, a lot of stories started coming to me, or scientists would be writing to me. The first book, I, I went out into the world, and that's, I went into the library and then into the world. This time, a lot of things were coming to me, and I was going into the world, and I started to notice certain themes. And I didn't anticipate these themes. But the first theme was that a lot of the interventions involved the use of energy to change the neuroplastic brain. So neuroplasticity is that property of the brain that allows it to change its structure and function in response to mental experience. But a number of these new uh, interventions were coupling some kind of energy-based intervention, sound, light, vibration. And I was seeing things that were um, really very much outside the existing mainstream paradigm. Mm -hmm. I mean, imagine this. Cases of, of light to heal or radically improve traumatic brain injury. Um, vibration on the back of the neck to in a number of cases cure um, attention deficit disorder. Vibration on the tongue to radically diminish the symptoms of Parkinson's, MS, traumatic brain injury, certain kinds of chronic pain like trigeminal neuralgia, which is a terrible form of pain, and movement even to um, take a girl who's missing a third of her cerebellum. The cerebellum uh, coordinates thoughts and movements, and it's packed with 80% of the brain's neurons. So that's a lot of a lot of neurons are lost when you lose one third of 80%. And she was supposed to be institutionalized, she couldn't move spontaneously, couldn't speak, etc. And this girl basically, through gentle movement of her body to stimulate the brain, um, has had normal development. So I was trying to figure out how is it possible for these energy based interventions to work. And I basically revisited. Um, a lot of different brain conditions and came up with an approach to them that emphasized not how they differed but what they had in common. As a medical student or a nursing student or, or some kind of health prof professional student, you, you try to first of all understand what is the difference between MS and Parkinson's and traumatic brain injury. And of course that's a very Western approach and it's a, it, it, there's, there's a lot to it. But I noticed that a lot of these conditions had very similar symptoms. Um, coordination problems, mental fog, multitasking difficulties, hypersensitivities, and so on. And then I did a study across many of these conditions of what was going on inside the brain. And I basically found that there were two things that were happening um, in the brains of these individuals across all of these difficulties. So, up till now, we have thought that if you had a stroke and lost, let's say, 90% of the movement of your right leg, that 90% of the neurons that would process movement in the right leg must be dead, or the tracks coming from them mm -hmm. must be interrupted. And what I found was that that's usually not the case. 
And this applies to many things, even kids who were born premature who we thought had hypoxia, in other words, absence of oxygen um, during a, a, a traumatic birth. That even in those cases, it's not the case that all those neurons are dead. What you usually have is the following. A small number are dead. Then neurons adjacent to the dead neurons that are accustomed to getting input from the dead neurons are suddenly bereft of this input. And so they're not performing uh, the way they used to. Many neurons have been affected by whatever um, is the pathological factor in the disease so that they're sick. And sick neurons actually still fire signals. It's just they don't fire them at the, the right rates. Mm -hmm. Usually neurons, the only time neurons don't fire signals is when they're dead. But if they're, if they're, if they're healthy, they tend, and there, there, there are variations to this, but they tend to fire a basal slow rate when they're off, and then a faster rate when they're on. In some cases, it's reversed. But there's an acceptable on rate. And in sick neurons, what you have is the neurons are firing usually too slowly or irregularly. So they're creating noise in the brain, junk data. And then healthy neurons are getting that junk data. So what you have is what I call a noisy brain. Yes. And electrophysiological studies show that this is happening in many, many conditions, not just a few. Okay, one of the things that, that I want to pick up on there, you mentioned the Western tradition. And one of the things that I find so exciting about your book is that you talk about a breakdown of the barriers between Western medicine and Eastern thinking about health. And nowhere is that more powerful than in the latest research on meditation sure. and the benefits of meditation. That's really exciting, isn't it? Yeah, it's very exciting to me. Um, you know, I want to emphasize this is a Western book, meaning that if I talk about energy, I'm talking about energy in terms that you, you, know, you can write equations on blackboards for the amount, the frequencies of light energy or sound energy that we're using to do this kind of healing. Sure, it's quantifiable. It's quantifiable. The, but the great strength of Western medicine has been that it's, it's basically appro it's approached things analytically. Analysis means, you know, it's, it's from the ancient Greek, it means to tear apart thoroughly, something like that. So we break things down. A person comes in and they're fatigued and short of breath. And then we localize it to the lungs if it's a pneumonia or to the heart if it's a heart valve problem. And then if it's a heart valve problem, we localize it to even smaller and smaller areas like in the valve. And then we can say, well, is there bacteria that's damaging the valve? And in the Western approach, in the, current, in the current period, ever since we started to do autopsies and find out about pathology and relate pathology to symptoms, the truth resides in the smaller unit. And in evidence. It's all evidence-based. Yes. yes. Um, of a particular kind of evidence. You know, your theory determines what counts as evidence. And so Western medicine is... It's, it's not, it's philosophically naive to say, as many people do, frankly, that there are facts and there are theories, and I want to live according to facts. But unfortunately, our theories determine what will count as facts. And so in this very rich Western tradition, we're analytic, we explain things in terms of DNA, proteins, molecules, little things. And we divide up our medical specialties as well. We don't, we, I guess we have general practitioners, but our specialties deal with just the heart or, or the kidneys or the brain. Now, that creates a lot of problems because it's only in textbooks that these things are separate. In reality, and this is the insight of Eastern medicine, which at one point may have been more analytic, but it turned its back on that. It said, you, can't, you have to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. And one of the unifying, so it's holistic. Mm -hmm. And I'm for a holistic Western medicine. Um, and there's things to be learned from, from the East about this. And they focused a lot more on energy. So Western medicine's had a lot to say about the brain and breaking it down into parts and so on. And very little, interestingly, clinically, to say about energy. The Western approach to energy is, I mean, it's, it's, it's often to roll your eyes when you hear about energy treatments, except for a, except for perhaps ECT and and a, f a few pacemaker treatments and so on, um, and to act as though it's unscientific. Of course, 
the most common symptom in all of Western medicine is an energy symptom. It's fatigue, right? And in our Western investigations, we make use of energy all the time. Someone will say, if you're talking about energy, it amuses me. They'll say, well, I want to see that in a scan because I don't really believe in this energy approach. But our scans are all based on energy. Like an fMRI or, you know, these, most of our scans, x-rays, to take the obvious example, are, are measuring, they're not really measuring um, this. You know, we're passing rays through things. Yeah. So there's this strange schism that clinically we've not in the West talked about making use of energy, even though we measure things with scans that involve energy. Whereas the East has had very little, to my mind, to say about the brain, um, but a lot to say about the mental and about energy. Mm -hmm. And I think these are all relevant to us. And I I'm, I'm use neuroplasticity as a, a concept to bridge these two really quite amazing um, medical traditions that humanity has because it's about using the mind to change the structure and function of the brain. But what I love as well about the book, Norman, is that so many of the solutions, I know you focus primarily on, on energy um, in this book, but some of your, your treatments are deceptively simple mm -hmm. things. So, for example, the impact of walking on someone with Parkinson's and the statistics about the benefits of walking in terms of reduction of Alzheimer's, this is really fantastic yes. news for all of us because we can all go for a walk. But yes, yes, some of these are very low tech. By reduction of Alzheimer's, I mean reduction of the risk of getting yes, Alzheimer's. Yes, but by up to 60%, yes, you're saying. Yes, yes, combined with other things. Well, just put very simply, um, there was a recent study, it was about a year ago, and it basically showed that if you did five uh, things, of which exercise was the most important, basically your men walked a mile to work and a mile home, or rode a bike 10 miles a day, or regular vigorous exercise, plus not smoking, not drinking, being a normal weight, and eating lots of fruits and vegetables. You could reduce the risk of getting dementia of any kind by 60%, which is staggering. And if any drug did that, everyone would be talking about it all Quite. the time. But people say, well, never mind exercise. Give me a drug that will help me lower. And of course, there is no such drug. Now, if you think of the five things I just said, they have something in common. They're all subtractive, by which I mean, they all take away um, innovations that have come with modernity in an industrial life. So we didn't normally walk around, you know, we didn't normally get from A to B in a machine. Take away the machine and you have exercise. Um, we didn't eat processed foods, we had fruits, fresh fruits and vegetables, and, and of course meat, um, most of us. And smoking and drinking are inventions and our aboriginal forebears, mm -hmm. you can see their ribs, um, and so on and so forth. So there are many, we now know that there are a staggering number of illnesses in our time, most of many of the chronic illnesses uh, that are caused by our sedentary, unnatural lifestyle. And the reason walking is so powerful, a, a neuroplastic intervention, is if you ask yourself, when does an animal go on a long walk? It's usually because it's leaving one territory because there's no food or there's a predator and moving into an unexplored area where it's gonna to have to do a lot of learning. And so in anticipation of that, um, these brain, bro brain growth factors <laughs> are triggered to set the brain up for lots of learning and even some new cells in parts of the brain between short-term memories and too long. Uh, so the reason that walking is so important in a number of neurological conditions where you start to lose the ability to move is because if you can't do some walking, you are going to deprive yourself of these brain growth factors that basically allow you to form new brain connections mm -hmm. and there are these glial cell growth factors that stabilize the infrastructure of the brain. So it really is a question of use it or lose it. Yes, and there are things that you can do to keep your brain in an optimally plastic state. Finally, uh, Norman, your writing is often compared with the writing of Oliver Sacks and, um, and you both bring us these wonderfully entertaining 
case histories um, and make the science very human and very approachable. I'm just wondering whether there's anything that you'd like to say about Oliver Sacks now that we know that he's not going to be with us for very much longer because he's tragically dying of, of liver cancer. Has he been an important influence on you? Oh my God, uh, unbelievably I rem important. Uh, and there's not a day that's gone by since I read that article in the, in the New York Times where mm -hmm. I haven't thought about him. It's um, his influence in 19, I think it was 1985, I went into a bookstore in the Upper East Side and I saw this you know, bizarrely titled book, The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat and started reading it and just it, it just felt, oh my God, finally there's some neurological writing, do you know, that's, it's beautifully written. I mean, Auden said that he was just, you know, a master of prose and I think that it's, it's utterly true. And it was beautifully written and it was so in tune with it. It wasn't about diseases, it was about people with diseases. He mm -hmm. got that so early on and he's just been such an inspiration. And you know, when my, when, when my, at a personal level, um, you know, when my book came out, they sent it out to 30 people just to, just to comment on it, because I was completely unknown. And they were wonderful people, and some of them I knew, uh, or I'd met once, you know, or something like that. And nobody responded, except Oliver Sacks. Oh. And he must have been the busiest of them all. And it made all the difference. And many years after, the, you know, a number of years after the book came out, I got to meet him once. And it's just such a precious time. But look, he will always be with us in a way yeah. because of how you know, extraordinary his work is. And um, he's also, you know, he's so humane. And he's, the, he reminds us of the power of a case history, which comes you know, his, his master was Luria. And um, Luria, you know, who invented neuropsychology, or arguably invented neuropsychology, um, was also originally very interested in psychoanalysis and in Freud and those case histories. And people don't know this, but uh, he set up the Kazakhstan <laughs> Psychoanalytic Society and then Stalin came to power. And one day he gave a speech where he was talking about the importance of Freud and these individual approaches and the and mind. And, and then the next day, he completely reversed himself because people were being, you know, carted off to the gulag. So that whole side of Luria had to be suppressed. Um, and so there's this tradition of writing in-depth case histories. Mm -hmm. And he called it, Luria called it romantic. There was, there was the romantic side of neuroscience where you, I, I wouldn't call it romantic by the way, except insofar as the romantics understood the power of subjectivity. Uh, but I actually think that not only are case histories um, of interest, I, I think you cannot have a mature neurology or psychiatry without in-depth case histories because there's just so much variation mm -hmm. in individuals that, and there's so much variation in the brain that this idea that the only way for us to advance is to do group studies is actually incorrect. Group studies are important insofar as they go. They also have limitations. You know, often the patients in group studies are not typical patients. I know this from psychiatry. If you do a, a group study of depressed patients, they say they're depressed but not that depressed. Uh, if you look at a lot of the, the studies, they, you know, some of them are more like depressed college students, not the deep melancholic depressives. And they can't be doing medication, but, uh, they can't be doing, sorry, drugs or self-medicating with, with alcohol, and they can't have person, huge personality issues or other medical issues. And as someone who worked you know, in downtown Toronto, seeing depressed patients, None of those people that I would have been working with would have gotten into those studies. So, the, you know, the studies have limits too. And the greatest cases in neurology have also taught us in some ways uh, every bit as much, if not more, than a lot of the studies. You know, the, the man who mistook his wife for hat is just one example, but there are many other examples. Thank you very much, Louis Thank you.